If you were born in the 90s, I'd wager that your favorite Disney animated film as a kid was probably this. Or at least The Lion King was my favorite Disney movie, and I've seen a lot of people share the sentiment. It's easy to see why. It boasts fantastic animation, an amazing soundtrack, and a truly epic scope. Memorable characters, a story with dramatic turns and developments, the first time a Disney character was allowed to fart on screen? The Lion King has it all. It was, and remains, a beloved animated classic that could never be replicated. But Disney sure as hell tried. Now, I agree that you should address an adaptation on its own merits without contrasting it to the source material too much. Like the video I just did on The Little Mermaid, I didn't try to judge it on how accurate it was to the original fairy tale. I only contrasted the two to emphasize the choices the creative team made. But 2019 Lion King makes it nearly impossible because it so closely copies the 1994 version. It keeps the same plot elements and the same characters. The composition is copied almost exactly from the 1994 storyboards. The same composer returned for the score. It keeps all the songs. It even has James Earl Jones reprise his role. It's not a reimagining if you're just copying the imagination of the team in the 1990s. But that said, they're not exactly identical. Oh no, everything in the 2019 movie is just worse. It'd be like if I painted this picture and hawked it as a new painting. It's fine ish in a vacuum, but you have to step out of that vacuum and compare it to another work to say, hey, that's just Starry Night, but a lot worse. And you'd be right. So that's why there will be places through this review where I have to pull out the 1994 movie in comparison to make my points. But before I go on the warpath, I'd like to start on a positive note, because I do have a positive note about this movie, and it involves the animation. Now, I have my thoughts about the stylistic choice to go super realistic, and I will get there in a moment. But beyond that choice, and just focusing on the technical details here, this movie is a remarkable achievement for computer-generated imagery. Oftentimes it's impossible to tell where the real world ends and the virtual world begins. So many of these animals look so real, it's legitimately stunning. Like, this scene where a prairie mouse or something, I don't know, whatever it is, scurries around through the grass. It's so cool! I cannot reiterate enough how impressive this all is on a technical level, and I have nothing but respect for the animators and technical leads who broke their backs to bring these scenes to life. I hope they were well compensated for their efforts. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. The Vancouver studio that made these scenes got underpaid by Disney and had to lay off all their employees. Well, my sense of positivity is gone. Let's get to the part you've been waiting for. So, as impressive as the skill on display is, I argue that a photorealistic style was the wrong choice to tell the story, or at least this degree of photorealism, because it dampens the emotion of the story. The whole goal of animation is to communicate emotion in a way that reality cannot. It heightens certain elements to emphasize different ideas or elicit different feelings, letting elements be funnier or more dramatic. At its most abstract, the medium can present complex and even contradictory ideas within a single shot more than words ever could. Animation has literally limitless visual potential. This is how Jean Favreau views that blank canvas. CG artists are tempted to make the skies beautiful, because why not? It costs the same amount, it's just as easy to do. But I find when I watch a movie with a lot of beautiful skies one after the other, I'm like, that's too lucky for real photography. In this clip from Vanity Fair, Favreau often uses the term naturalism to describe his approach to the movie. And you know, naturalism is absolutely a valid style to pursue. The problem with photorealism for The Lion King is that it doesn't fit a story about talking lions and singing animals. John Favreau talks about wanting to make it look like a documentary. In order to keep it feeling a bit more like a documentary and more like something that was natural and to try to fool people into thinking they were seeing something that was live action. But this is not a documentary. It's a story where animals sing musical numbers and appear as ghosts in the sky. When the movie first opens, it seems like it could actually work because, again, it is very technically impressive. But then we see the main characters and it quickly falls apart. 
Animals do not express emotions the way humans do. That's where they're anthropomorphized in media to have characteristics we can associate with them. The decision to remove this expressiveness from the visuals undercuts the emotional connection we feel with these characters. It has all the dramatic punch of an episode of Hammy the Hamster. I knew you could do it, GP. You're so clever. Well, yes, I, uh, of course I am. I just did, uh, what, uh, what did I do? This creative decision doesn't hurt the movie, it cripples the movie. Just in the circle of life, you can see these emotional beats in the first film. The warmth evident in the relationships between the characters. In 2019, it's gone. There's no warmth between Mufasa and Zazu, or Mufasa and Rafiki. When Rafiki takes baby Simba to the point of Pride Rock and holds him up, the line of action in the animation is so striking in the one, and so... not striking in the other. Of course, Favreau has an explanation for that. But unfortunately, the center of gravity uh, would not work in the way the anatomy is on our baboon friend Rafiki here. In a, in a drawing, it looks good, but whenever we pose Rafiki that way, it always looked fake. Maybe that should have been the cue that this was not the right approach. And on a related note, do you notice the directing and editing on the original? The dramatic zoom, the quick cuts, all of these elements that you might not even really notice unless you're looking for them. When you combine them, they create a visual jolt that coincides with the crescendo of the music. Even if you don't notice it consciously, it still has an impact on you. And again, the 2019 version, the camera motions are a lot flatter this time around, and combined with the character designs, it makes the movie feel so lifeless compared to the original. The issue pervades through the entire movie. The colorful and vibrant energy of I Just Can't Wait to Be King, which is a playful expression of a young Simba looking forward to being in charge, becomes this. Oh, I just can't wait, just can't wait to be king. The terrifying yellow fire of Be Prepared with its evocations of the Nazi's triumph of the will is now a scar just kinda pacing up a mountainside. The juxtaposition of visual realism with each incidental musical number feels discordant and jarring. It lacks the energy of the animated version, and more importantly, I don't feel like anything's been gained. The Lion King has traded away its liveliness and impact and received nothing in return. Now I will say this approach could have worked, but it would involve reworking the story entirely. Imagine for a moment if the film had gone all in with the documentary style angle. That would mean no singing and, more radically, no talking. Instead, all the animals pantomime. Maybe we have some incidental background score to clarify tone. But basically, the whole story unfolds as if they really were animals without dialogue. In fact, as I was making this video, I had to re-record this part because Jon Favreau produced a series called Prehistoric Planet which he used photorealistic animation to portray dinosaurs. And guess what? It's really, really good! Precisely because it's written to mirror a documentary which complements the visual style a lot better. This fits. This does not fit. Anyways, back after the circle of life, we get the scene of Mufasa confronting Scar. Scar mopes around to say, I'm evil. And then we get... Well, there's one in every family, sire. I had a cousin who thought he was a woodpecker. He slammed his head into trees, and our beaks aren't built for it. He was concussed regularly. Oh, you've gone. So look, I know comedy is subjective. That's very true. What's not funny to me might be funny to someone else. I mean, hell, this is the dumb stuff that makes me laugh. And I said, the pacifier, more like Bor Ragnarok. So, take this next section with a grain of salt. But I hate the comedy in this movie so much. In the original, the lines were shorter, snappier, and the voice actors had a sharp delivery. <sighs> There's one in every family, sir. Two in mine, actually. In 2019, they just drove on and on, rambling out of control. And things that might have been funny if delivered quickly just go into a death spiral. Plus, there's just something about the delivery here that feels like they're underlining the punchline too hard. Like, it's expecting an audience laugh instead of it just being delivered straight. They but, low uh, to the ground. Cheetahs never prosper. Yeah, okay, stay low to the ground, right? Of course, as I say, cheetahs never prosper. That's what I say. Do you get? I I'll say it again. Cheetahs never prosper. <laughs> another comic character is one of the hyenas, who always stands too close to another hyena. Pretty 
you want me to? I need some personal space. Okay. Okay. Not to take anything away from you. You were great, but he is woof. See, now I know you're doing this on purpose. Seriously? Oh, I'm sorry. That's a good distance right there. Okay. And then there's Timon and Pumbaa. Again, in the 1994 animation. Short, quick lines, sharp delivery. Of course. Who's the brains in this outfit? Uh. My point exactly. Jeez, I'm fried. In 2019, they threw down their scripts and literally just improvised the whole movie. And that's not my phrasing, it's theirs. Uh, John had us throw our scripts down and literally improvise. And God, does it show that they improvised. What did you say to him? I don't know. As you were saying it, I thought this won't end well. You just start laughing. You laugh too. I did not, I would never. Um, um, we were not worried. No, not worried. There's no worries. No, Hakuna Matata. We were concerned uh, because, because, you know, you're our friend. What? Hakuna Matata. Hakuna Matata. Hakuna, most people get a bigger reaction when we say it the first. Okay. Some people well, start anyway, clapping Hakuna immediately. Hakuna Matata. It, it means no worries. Oh, I love that last one because it ages so well when you're watching it at home. People get a bigger reaction when we say it the first. Okay. Some people well, start anyway, clapping Hakuna immediately. Matata. It, it means no worries. One minute. Okay. I, I do I'm the just, counting I here. Again, this is more of a subjective point because maybe you do think this is funny. I just don't. Anyways, let me get back to the main story, which honestly I've addressed most of my problems with already. I can't wait to be king isn't as fun. Simba and Nala get saved from the hyenas by Mufasa. Be prepared isn't as interesting, but I want to pause and really take a look at the famous Gulch scene, because this is such a central point to the story and it gets horrifically kneecapped here. To start, I want to point out this little change they do. Really rather small, but it significantly changes the way the scene feels to me. In the animated version, Scar teases Simba about his roar, saying that he might want to work on it. Simba does, and he believes that's what sparks the stampede that kills Mufasa. It's a subtle thing that helps complete Scar's deception. Scar doesn't outright tell him, hey, roar as loud as you can, right here, right now, do it! That way, Simba feels more responsible. Here, Scar does do exactly that. Even Mufasa came here when he was your age. Refused to leave until his roar could be heard above the rim. All the way up there? That's when you know you found it. It makes his manipulation feel less subtle. Anyways, the stampede starts and Mufasa saves Simba, but gets caught in the valley, and then we get the betrayal. Let me dig in real deep to this moment here. This scene from 1994 is an iconic scene. Mufasa is struggling to hang on, and for the first time in the whole movie, we see him desperate. He calls out for Scar to help him. You can hear his voice, the great Mufasa for the first time pleading. Brother, help me! Long live the king. The way Scar lunges, the way Mufasa roars in pain, makes these emotions big and impactful. And then this shot, where we see both their faces, both their emotions at once. Great use of cinematography to communicate two things at the same time. Mufasa's visibly appalled, and Scar's got this devilish smile as he twists the knife, no longer needing to hide his scheme. This shot, where the terrible realization clicks into place for Mufasa, visibly darkens to accentuate the tone. And then Scar rips Mufasa's grip from the stone, sending him falling to his death, to Simba's utter horror. It's dramatic, it's harrowing, and there are so many little accents that make it more impactful. Here's how the scene goes in 2019. Help me. Long live the king. Ah! 
Again, the lions can't emote like before. The lines aren't delivered with the same gravitas. The visual language doesn't communicate as effectively or as strongly. And then Scar just kind of bops him in the face. It's hilarious. Is it more akin to how a cat might attack something? Long live the king. <laughs> yeah, sure, whatever, but it's less dramatic. Realism is not automatically better. How many times do I have to say it? The same thing happens in the climax, actually, when Scar corners Simba. Again, the dramatic pounce with his claws versus this little hop he does. Dramatically different visual weight. Anyways, so Scar tells Simba to run away, six says hyenas on him, and Simba runs out into the desert where he collapses and Timon and Pumbaa save him. I've already addressed the issues I have with these incarnations. So let's move on, because it's about this point that oh, the film actually strays away from the established story a bit, and it's bad. Now, when people say this is a shot-for-shot -shot remake, it's a half-truth, because yes, almost every single story beat is identical to the 1994 film. Simba is the crown prince of the Pride Lands. Jealous Uncle tries to get him killed by hyenas. Then he tries to kill Simba with a stampede, and finally murders the King Mufasa at the same time. Simba runs away, and takes on a new, lackadaisical lifestyle. Scar's reign is cruel and terrible. Nala arrives and begs Simba to help. He refuses, gets a visit from his ghost dad. God, no, not that one. Big epic battle, the end. Now sure, Jon Favreau himself says it's not a shot-for-shot -shot remake. <laughs> Fun fact, you know that the original people who storyboarded these shots didn't get paid residuals? In general, artists and writers in Hollywood get paid residuals when their work and scripts are reused. But the people who planned out these shots and helped work the script for the 1994 Lion King? Big ol' goose egg. Just a little food for thought. Stepping back, I will concede that the 2019 version isn't totally the same as the original, because there are small changes to the characters. For example, the hyenas aren't the lackeys of Scar, rather they're led by Shenzi, who is now like, I don't know, the hyena queen, and she makes a pact with Scar which makes his position a bit more precarious. This much I don't mind, it doesn't harm the movie for me, but it doesn't really add anything for me either. But there are other changes which frankly bother me more than is probably reasonable, such as this part here. Simba, you can't escape your destiny. Like, what? That's such a weird way to say that. Wouldn't Simba, you can't run away from your responsibilities sound, I don't know, a bit more natural? Now there's about a 20 minute segment of the film that has the starkest departure from the story. Though departure isn't really the right word, more like elaboration, because it fills in certain details that weren't filled in in the 1994 one. For starters, Scar is an incel now. Long ago, you chose Mufasa over me, but now there is a new king. So stop being so selfish. Which is a choice they made. Not a particularly memorable one, I forgot it between viewings, so it has very little impact. It does correspond to a cut scene from the animated version, but I don't think it was really worth bringing it back because it doesn't add anything. The scene also fleshes out the reasons why hyenas are viewed with such disdain. The lions will eat after the hyenas, and they don't leave much behind. But really this just makes more explicit something that was already implied, so again it adds nothing of substance. All in all, I don't really care for this scene. Then we have a scene where Nala sneaks away from Pride Rock, which, again, doesn't add anything entertaining or interesting, and I think was just included because I imagine hiring Beyonce as a voice actor was expensive and they wanted their money's worth. And I'll talk about Beyonce as a voice actor in a little bit, but this edition, don't really like it either. We have a scene where Simba and Timon and Pumbaa talk about their diverging life philosophies, which makes it sound a lot more interesting than it really is. You sure it's not a circle? That we're all connected? A circle would mean we're all this. That would mean what I do affects him, affects yeah. that thing, no. affects that thing. That's not how it goes. Which would make doing whatever we wanted not that cool. Thumbs down, don't like it. 
Finally, we have my personal favorite scene of this movie, which fills in such a crucial missing detail. In the 1994 version, we have this moment where Simba feels something is very wrong with his new lackadaisical lifestyle. He flops down, sending a swirl of dust into the air, which travels across the land all the way to Rafiki, who surmises from it that Simba is still alive, and has a kind of spiritual or magical quality to it. It's also short. You can see how many seconds it takes to get from point A all the way to point B. But gee golly gosh, that's just not realistic enough. So we have what I affectionately call the dung ball scene. Simba flicks his head and a tuft of his fur goes all the way through the air to a stream, to being picked up by a bird, to falling in the way of some giraffes which eat it, and then it fades to a dung beetle rolling it along, and then it gets picked up by some ants which carry it all the way to Rafiki. Lion King 94 is an hour and 28 minutes long. Lion King 2019 is exactly 30 minutes longer, precisely because of scenes like this. Did we need two and a half minutes to elaborate on a 15 second segment? The answer is no, of course we didn't! If anything, this makes the moment feel less mystical, less interesting. We have 33% more movie, and yet at the same time, we have less story. That's a real Disney magic at play. Anyways, we come back to the jungle where Nala finds Simba, and they reconnect, again without any of the emotional beats of the animation. What else matters? You're alive. And that means you're the king. Simba, we need to leave. Scar has taken over with the hyenas. You have to take your place as king. Okay, I gotta talk about it now. Beyonce is not a voice actor. No, she's not. A singer, yes, and a good one at that. I won't deny that she is talented. But when Nala speaks, I only hear Beyonce in a recording booth. Seeing you again? You don't know what this will mean to everyone. Tell me, really honestly tell me that you believe Disney hired Beyonce because they thought she was a talented voice actor and not because she's a celebrity with selling power. Not just to sell the movie, but also to sell her tie-in album called The Lion King The Gift. Oh, give me a goddamn break. The Gift? Really? On the same page, James Earl Jones sounds really tired in this movie. Don't get me wrong, this is not a slight against him, because he did a wonderful job as Mufasa in the 94 version. And when they announced he'd be returning as Mufasa for 2019, people took it as a massive favor to the fans. He sounds exhausted to be reading the same lines again. You could have been killed. You deliberately disobeyed me. And what's worse, you put Nala in danger. You could have been killed. And what's worse, you put Nala in danger. Hey, his son was awake. Before sunrise, he's your son. Your son's awake. Before sunrise, he's your son. You ruled all of that? Yes. The man's 90 years old. Let's stop trotting him out to record every time Disney needs another Lion King or Star Wars movie. Anyways, the movie goes on fast forward now as Simba and Nala go through Can You Feel the Love Tonight and their disagreements on whether Simba should face Scar. To be fair though, it's an issue I have with the 1994 version as well. The third act there also felt a bit too fast, so it gets a bit more of a pass. Then Simba meets Rafiki, and we get this scene where Simba is encouraged to go home, however difficult it may be, and face his uncle. Wait, what? What do you mean the part's not in the movie? This moment, it's not in the 2019 version! Oh yes, the past can hurt. But the way I see it, you can either run from it, or learn from it. Ah! You see? That's the theme of the whole movie! And it got cut out? Not to mention the scene with Mufasa has also been truncated. Simba, you have forgotten me. No. How could I? You have forgotten who you are and so forgotten me. Look inside yourself, Simba. You are more than what you have become. So, let me get this straight. The Lion King 2019 is half an hour longer, but can't afford 60 seconds to include the actual thematic crux of the story? It's like cutting the punchline off a joke. Knock knock. Who's there? Joe. Joe who? That's because this movie doesn't want to have a theme. 
It doesn't want to tell a complete story. It only wants to present the iconography of the Lion King, like this shot where Rafiki pulls out his staff. My old friend. It's making such a big dramatic deal out of this because, oh my goodness, it's Rafiki's staff. Rafiki pulled out his staff. But it's not important in the movie. It's not an Excalibur, it's just a stick that he uses. But it's a thing the audience recognizes. The reason I feel the need to contrast Lion King 2019 to the 94 version is that it only exists to bank off the 94 version. So much of this movie seems to just revolve around pointing out how popular the first one is. Even more than you'd expect for a remake, it makes strange meta commentary on this. Remember that joke from earlier? Most people get a bigger reaction when we say it the first- Okay. Some people well, start anyway, clapping Hakuna immediately. Matata. The film's aware that it's part of this cultural shift away from films led by actors or directors or writers and towards films led by intellectual property, IP. And it's not even content with just copying Lion King, like this moment where Simba and his friends return home and they distract the hyenas. It is with deepest pride and greatest pleasure that we proudly present your dinner. Be our guest. Hey, thanks. That reminds me that this abomination is next in my sights. That's the fatal flaw in this film to me. It only exists to remind people of the 94 version. It wants to showcase the visuals and famous lines and the sound bites while removing the parts that gave them any actual meaning. The trick is to make people feel like they saw the old movie when you show them the new one. And if you show them the shots and the moments that they remember in lines of dialogue or songs, it kind of checks the boxes in their mind. It's a product designed to require no media literacy and even discourage media literacy. I've heard people say they like it because it reminds them of the 1994 Lion King. To which I say, then just watch that one. The Lion King that actually gave a damn about its story, because the 2019 version demonstrably does not. This movie, for all its effort, doesn't manage to recapture the magic of the original film. It doesn't even mean to. Its only value comes from repackaging the most nostalgic moments of the first Lion King, and any changes only add bloat to and dampen the emotions of the story. Both within the text and behind the scenes, the Lion King 2019 is a testament to the ongoing drive in Hollywood to wring genuine talent dry in service of the almighty intellectual property without any regard to what made those stories special in the first place. And oh yes, your time is coming. Your time is coming. <laughs> <laughs>